Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome to Upcoming Wargames Volume 3. Now in this series, we take a look at 10 upcoming wargames from various wargaming companies across the planet, give a little bit of an overview of the game, and I talk a little bit about why it's caught my interest and why it's on my radar. Now these games are in no particular order. Some of them might be close to imminent release and others might be in kind of pre-order systems of these different companies. Let's jump right in and get started. So when I put together these episodes, I generally look through the list of games that have kind of accumulated since the last episode and this one. Now, some of these games people have told me about, some of these games I read about on forums, I see them on Twitter, you might see them on Board Game Geek, or I hear about them from other people. Okay, and then before I make the episode, I go into different companies, I kind of poke around their websites, because let's face it, some wargaming companies aren't the, so aggressive in terms of marketing their games. So I like to look at their websites to see what's going on. And that's how I found this game from Nuts Publishing, Italia 1917 to 1918. This game caught my eye for a number of reasons, but let's talk a little bit about some of the features first. So it's World War I, and you're going to play Italy, France, United States, and Great Britain pushing up against the central powers of Austria, Hungary, and Germany. Game starts in October of 1917 and ends in November of 1918, and there are six scenarios. One of the reasons why this caught my eye is that I feel like this is an aspect of wargaming that really hasn't been highlighted that much. Another good feature, this game is based on the operational game system that's used in Somme 1918, which is a highly regarded, another highly regarded World War I war game. So I'm pretty excited about this one, and I confess it's also, I like its kind of mini monster aspect, if you would. Counters look great, and there are 700 counters. Six scenarios in the game, and the game uses a two-map system, so it's got, and I'm not, I confess I don't quite, understand how the maps work out and are put together and things like that. But the basic gist of the, situ the situation is that you've got two map systems for the smaller scenarios, and I think five of the six scenarios actually play out this way. You can use a map where the, a side of the maps where the hexes are much enlarged. So you're playing on a smaller area of what would be the larger campaign map. And so they give you larger hexes to create uh, more room for your counters to move around and just make for a better ergonomic game playing experience. And then you've got that large largest scenario that perhaps uses the other sides of the map where the hexes are smaller and that feels more like the campaign game where you're going to be using almost all the units. But the counters look great. The maps look great. It's built on a good pedigree of a game, Somme 1918, which is a highly regarded game in this kind of genre, subgenre. So I'm pretty excited about this one. The good news is, is that it's reached its pre-order requirement. So it looks like this one is going to come to the light of day. Our second game is Downfall from GMT Games. Now, this is a game about the conquest of the Third Reich from 1942 to 1945. And if we take a look at the kind of the simple view of the map here, we can see that it includes France and all the way over to Moscow. So we've got the Soviets pushing into Germany from the east and then the Allies pushing into Germany from the west. Now, there's a few reasons to get excited about this game. And this one I've actually already pre-ordered and I've pre-ordered the mounted maps because there's a couple of reasons why this one is a no-brainer for me. First of all, one of the neat concepts of about this game, right? It's a two player game. And get this, the, the allied player controls the allied forces moving in from the West and the Germans fighting against the Soviet forces coming from the East. The Soviet player controls the Soviet forces coming from the East and the German forces fighting against the allies from the West. So what a neat concept, I think, for this kind of downfall mechanism where you've got the two players each playing against each other on two different fronts. I mean, that's just pretty cool. The second thing about this game is the designer's pedigree. So there's two designers that worked on this game. Chad Jensen, the late Chad Jensen, of course, he created the Combat Commander Europe and Dominant Species. And of course, everybody knows how popular and how well-loved the Combat Commander Europe series is. Now, he worked on this game for about 10 years. And then, of course, he passed away in 2019. The second designer to pick it up since then to take it to completion is John Butterfield. Now, if you know this channel a little bit, you know that I'm a huge fan of John Butterfield's work. If you put John Butterfield's name on the design of the game, I'm getting it. That's it. I'm just getting it. I think his games are brilliant. They're fresh. They're so well thought out. And for whatever reason, I, I actually, I think... John Butterfield's rule books are the most fun rule books for me to read. I don't know why. I just enjoy it. I feel like as soon as I think of a question, his rule book has the answer. So yeah, huge fan of, of, 
of John Butterfield's designs and of course Chad Jensen's pedigree is outstanding as well. So both kind of both of these designers having worked on this game, I think gives it a lot of promise. Now I did also see this game. I got a demo. I got a chance to see a demo play of this game at the San Diego Historical Games Conference a little while ago. And that helped kind of cement this feeling that this is going to be a really unique game. It's got about 300, I think 384 counters. You've got an initiative system for movement that's rather unique and innovative. Over a hundred cards to drive events to give the game variability and things like that. Looks like it's going to be a very tight game. And I love the challenges that John Butterfield's influence on a game brings to it. It just feels like everything is so well thought out. And I feel like you have a lot of fun decisions when you play one of his games. So a lot to look forward to on this one. The good news is that this has also crossed its P500 mark. So this one should go into GMT's production queue at some point in the near future. Our next game isn't a game in itself. It's a module. But... It caught my eye for a number of reasons because it seems to have some eye-popping characteristics that really caught my attention. Advanced Squad Leader Manila. Now, I have to confess, I have the Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit number one. So I've dipped my toes into the Advanced Squad Leader pool, but I'm a little reluctant to go jump into the pool because it's such a big ocean of games and it kind of becomes all-encompassing. I'm enjoying the starter kit right now, but I know there are tons of people that love the system, and this one caught my eye as something that I really haven't seen in some of the modules before, so I thought it would make sense to include it in here. So basically, Advanced Squad Leader Manila covers the conflict with the U.S. forces trying to wrest control back from Manila from the Japanese occupiers in January of 1945. Now, the real conflict saw over, saw over 100,000 Japanese, 100,000 civilian deaths and large destruction across the city. ASL, the ASL Manila module takes us to Manila to fight some of the battles in the city during this time. But here's the thing that caught my eye about this module. It's scope and scale, right? So there are six, six 24 inch by 37 inch maps. You butt them together and you can basically make the whole city. 25 scenarios, four counter sets, plus all the other counter sets you're going to bring in from your other modules to be able to play this. And maybe advanced squad leader fans can, can kind of correct me on this. When it says that this is a module, do you just need Beyond Valor to be able to play this? Or do you need Beyond Valor, you know, Beyond Valor in the rules to play this? Or do you need more modules than just that? And I'm sure advanced squad leader fans can help me out here because I'm, I'm a little bit kind of tenuous in terms of my understanding of advanced squad leader world. The other thing, however, that caught my eye here is 25 scenarios and five campaign games. I mean, a campaign game of advanced squad leader? I didn't know that existed. So maybe, again, maybe advanced squad leader fans are going to put down and they say, oh, we've had campaign games for advanced squad leader for a long time. But I haven't seen a module of this scope and scale. And I haven't seen really a designed campaign game for advanced squad leader. But in any case, whether it exists or not, it seems pretty cool that this module has got such a large scope and scale for advanced squad leader fans. I would think it would be an instant like knee jerk reflex. I got to have this kind of game. I mean, the urban combat, you've got the massive scope and scale of campaign games. Seems like an advanced squad leaders dream game. The good thing about this one as well is it has reached its order minimums on multi-man publishing site. So it will see the light of day and go into production. Um, if you have other information below that would help viewers on the advanced squad on this module and where I've made some mistakes here, let me know. Because again, I'm kind of a little bit nebulous on the whole advanced squad leader world. Our next game is our first solitaire game in this episode, American Tank Ace, 1944 to 1945 from Compass Games and designed by Gregory Smith. Now, if you recognize that name, I think you're a long way towards understanding what this game feels like. Yes, Gregory Smith is the designer of The Hunters, The Hunted, Beneath the Sea, Silent Victory. He's since gone on to design the patrol boat games and other ones like that that take this solitaire experience of you being a single, single submarine and taking you through all the way through a campaign of the war. And as you read this description, this is that except you're in a tank. 
which is to my think it's the first understanding that he's tried to take his model for this solitaire system and bring it to armored combat. It sounds cool. You get to command one of nine different US tank models. The game starts in June of 1944 and it ends in April of 1945. The odds are low that you'll make it all the way through, but your crew can receive promotions and things like that. You can increase your experience. You can get better tanks and give you a better prestige that will give you a little bit more abilities. You're going to be going in these tactical combat situations against random kind of enemy opponents. You get the idea. It's the hunters, except you're in a tank fighting your way through France and Germany in World War II. So I'm really curious to see how this system has been adopted for this type of thing. But I trust the designer. I mean, if there's one thing that these games do is they just ooze the kind of creative narrative. They evoke narrative and story. I mean, the, the career of your crew members and all those kinds of things, what happens on your various missions. It's just, there's an art to it that I think Gregory Spring Smith brings to his design process that creates such a fine level of variety and excitement and narrative when you play the game. So I'm pretty excited about it. I also, one of the things I like about the submarine games, like the Hunters and stuff like that, is that an individual mission doesn't take very long and you can play a whole campaign in a relatively short time span. Now, the description for American Tank Ace says that um, individual missions are going to be about 10 minutes and the gameplay is about two to three hours. Of course, you know, one game could be 10 minutes if you get killed on your first mission, of course, but the general length is probably going to be about two to three hours, which means that you can kind of play a whole campaign and create this story of your tank and its crew in a single sitting, which is, I think, one of the appealing features of this. Now, I like bigger campaign games and solo, camp solo campaigns like this too, but it is nice to have something that's comp compartmentalized and distilled down to the essence of good gameplay that you can play in a single sitting. So I'm looking forward to this one. I'm looking forward to seeing how it comes out and looking forward to it also that it's got a mid-2022 release. Our next game is a very interesting game. Jung Ah from GMT Games, co-designed by Jeff Engelstein and David Thompson. Now, what is this game? Well, Zheng Ah was a Chinese admiral who lived from 1371 to 1433. And during the course of his lifetime, he went on and led a series of seven expeditionary voyages to Southeast Asia, India, and the Persian Gulf. Now, these were largely diplomatic voyages, but there were some military elements to their trips. Now, the thing about this that I think is really interesting is that these voyages consisted of hundreds of ships, like 300 ships and stuff like that. They had thousands and thousands of sailors going on these ships. They had treasure ships, like one voyage, I think, had 60 treasure ships, that these ships were 400 feet long, 160 feet wide, and contained multiple stories. So in this game, you play Jung Ah, and you're trying to kind of make these expeditionary forces as long as your political will holds out. you got some goals to establish. You're trying to um, visit ports. You're trying to establish envoys. You could have some military elements in there. But basically, you're trying to accumulate victory points by doing a bunch of different tasks. And I've heard it also described as kind of a, a sandboxy exploration type game. And that's where I think it gets interesting. So this is a little bit of a side point, but I think it's relevant to this discussion. I want to really like exploration games. I think exploration games and discovery games are really intriguing and really interesting. The thing is, I think they're really hard to make, right? So uh, I, here we have a topic of game that I think is extraordinarily challenged to design for, and we have two designers of very high pedigree. Now, Jeff Engelstein, I haven't played any of his games yet, but, I, I, but I've played a number of games from David Thompson. Every game that I've played from David Thompson he's been involved in, I have really enjoyed. So here we have a designer that I feel like everything he touches is fun to play, and a topic of a game, exploration and discovery, that I feel is really hard to design fun experiences for. So I am super interested to see how this turns out. I mean, when you put these two things together, what's going to happen, right? Now, the other thing I like, I'm interested about this game that I think is 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 a factor in why I'm intrigued by it is I'm I'm glad that we're taking this is a game that shines a historical light on an area and a period of time that we often in the West either know very little about and never really talk about, right? So we're going into kind of Asia, China in the 1300s and the 1400s. You know, this is an area of history that most of us are largely ignorant about. So I love it when historical games kind of willing to take that step into an era and a time period in history that really doesn't come at this from that Western perspective. So I'm really hopeful the game turns out really well, really well. I'm gonna be following this along. It is started now in its P500 system with GMT Games 
It's accelerating pretty fast. And I think even though it was announced just a short while ago, it's pretty close to approaching 400 orders and it needs 500, of course, to go into production. So um, still got some ways to go, but it's off to a great start. So very curious about this one. I'm really excited to see how it comes out. Super excited to see which way it goes and looking forward to seeing it uh, kind of in the physical form and getting a chance to play it. Okay, I was debating whether to include this game or not, but what the heck, we're just going to put it in here because we're on the topic of exploration games in the previous game. Here we go. Dr. Livingstone, I presume, from Decision Games. Another one of the games that I was kind of poking around Decision Games website, and I stumbled onto this game. It's got a picture here of the cover, and that's it. There's no page on Board Game Geek. But when I read the details, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like a monster discovery game. An exploration game. So as you can assume, based on the title, right, this is a game of exploration in Africa in the 1800s. And each player, two to four players, although it's high for solitaire play, each player controls a group of African explorers. Now, here's the components of the game that really kind of caught my eye. I'm going to have to look down and read them a little bit. Uh, a mounted map board, 50 terrain tiles, 100 discovery discs, 100 explorer and event cards, 250 cubes and discs, a 32-page rule book, reference charts and tables, expedition markers, and a price tag of 120 bucks. I mean, this, this sounds massive, right? And I mean, this this I, I again for that search for this kind of amazing exploration game. This sounds like this is something that I haven't really seen attempted before. Exploration of Africa in the 1800s. Now you've got also some elements there in colonialism, like how is that going to be handled, of course. But the intrigue for me from this game, it's like, oh, an exploration game that sounds really good. But here's the thing. There's no board game geek page on it. There's no images of it. This is really all you've got. Like, is this even a real game? Does anybody out there know? Like, is, is there a screenshot of it or something? Is it like being play tested? Is it like just a random idea? Who knows? But hopefully someday at some point, this game will see the day at light of day and it'll be really awesome. Next up, a traditional Hex Encounters game, yet one I am very much looking forward to. North Africa 1941, published by GMT Games and designed by, yes, Mark Simonich. So I'm a big fan of the 19XX series. I feel like they're a very playable series of games, and yet there's enough complexity and meat to the rules that they address all the nuances of the particular theater. And what's particularly nice about a series of games like this is that Although each game feels different, you've got enough overlap in rules so that the overhead for learning how to play the next game in the series is pretty smooth and pretty easy to handle. Now, given that I'm a big fan of the series already and I like the work that Mark Simonich does in this series, I'm also a huge fan of North Africa. And this game has a lot of features that I think make it or just make it very enticing. It's going to have two counter two maps. 22 by 28 inch and then a 22 by 34 inch, three campaigns. So you've got a campaign campaign game that goes from I think March of 1941 until December of 1941. Then you've got Operation Battle Axe and Operation Crusader in there for smaller, uh, smaller games. So you've got three scenarios basically in the box. Uh, two counter set, you're gonna have all the nuances of rules to handle North African desert combat. So I'm not sure there's a ton to say about this. It's just Two good things really put together. My interest in North African World War II history and a Mark Simonich game. It's like, yeah, that's a no-brainer for me. So this one too, I think it's made its way. I think it's cleared its uh, P500 goals with GMT Games and is somewhere along that production system past that. So very much looking forward to this one. The next game, if you're familiar with stuff that I've put out on the channel so far, you're going to understand why this one would be a game that I would be interested in. Wolfpack from GMT Games and designed by Mike Berticelli. Now, I got a chance to see an early prototype version of this at the San Diego Historical Games Conference a while back. It immediately caught my attention. First of all, it's U-Boats, right? And it's a solitaire game, but it's also a co-op game. So it's one to four players. If you play in solitaire, you're going to command anywhere from two to four U-Boats. If you're playing with other people, it's going to be either one to two U-Boats that you're commanding. And in, unlike in some of the other submarine, submarine simulations, where it's you, basically one submarine attacking kind of individual groups of ships. In this game, it models an entire convoy of ships and you as the wolf pack hunting around the outskirts, trying to find the right angles of approach and then coming in and trying to hit your targets. And so you've got that same kind of risk versus re reward decision making that I think makes uh, underwater submarine combat so intriguing and so rewarding, especially in terms of um, its ability to generate narrative that I think this game could be really, really cool. The other thing about the game, of course, that I like 
campaign game. So it's not just an individual mission that you're playing. You're linking these together. Your crews are getting more experience. Your tonnage determines how much experience you get, determines how better, how much better your, your submarine and your crews get. And from there, it kind of goes on as you kind of fight your way through the war. So my radar is very high on this one. Now, I haven't automatically pulled the plug on it because I saw a very early prototype version of the game. So I haven't made up my final decision. I kind of want to see a little bit more gameplay before I decide on it. But U-Boats, campaign game, what I saw looked really, really good. So the radar is definitely finely tuned for this one. Likewise, this one has also cleared its 500 order mark on GMT games. So it should be into or moving its way along in that production system pretty soon. Our next game, I was debating whether to put it into this or not, because one of the things I was thinking about is, is this a war game or is it a Euro game? And I finally decided that I think it's actually more, it's, it's got elements of both, but it's so intriguing. And I feel like there's a lot of war gamey elements to it that I feel like it belongs here. Talking about Song of War from Invicta Rex. Now, this is a game I just learned about a couple of weeks ago. I saw one of their tweets and I kind of read up about the game and looked at it. It's being demoed now, I think, at Origins as I'm creating this. Looks like a fascinating game. It's a massive game about the Mediterranean theater. You have two, scenar two scenarios inside the box, 1942 campaign and a 1943 campaign. One of the things that immediately can caught my eye about this, I like these large scale games that are playable in an evening or a single setting because the 1943 campaign is listed as about two to four hours of playtime. The 1942 campaign in this game is listed as four to seven hours. So this game that you can kind of play the whole ebb and flow of a theater of a war in a single evening has a lot of appeal. And it, I think it has a lot of appeal, especially as I'm still working on bringing more friends that play Euro games, but not really haven't played many war games. I feel like this would be another game that could kind of help bring them into the flock, if you would, of leading them into perhaps some more complicated war games. Production values, however, are through the roof on this. It's a massive game. There's just so much there. Let me just read a little bit about some of the things that are in the box, right? First of all, we have a 54 inch by 31 inch map. So a huge map of the Mediterranean theater. And looking at the production values, they look really outstanding on this. 477 unit tiles. That's a lot of unit tiles. 30 unique models for plat for units as well. Uh, 17 objective tiles, national support cards. You've got some hidden fleet dials. So the game, that kind of brings up a second point. The game is listed as two to four players. And I know a lot of people that watch this channel are interested in solitaire games. So one of the questions I have that I'm not sure if I can answer is, how does it work with solitaire gameplay? And I see that there's a hidden fleet dial, which creates some of kind of that ambiguity in the fog of war with fleet movements and things like that. So I wonder how that part might play out solitaire. Otherwise, it seems like it would be a fairly effective solitaire experience. So maybe overall, the solitaire experience will still be pretty good. Mine tokens, it comes with storage trays, but just kind of, you know, as you can see in these screenshots, there is a lot to like here. So very interested in this game, company I haven't heard much about. It's a game that came kind of out of the blue for me. But again, I do like the idea of playing a whole theater. I like the idea of a game that can be enticing for people who haven't played a lot of war games. I like being able to play a whole theater and being able to play it in a single sitting. And the production values of this look through the roof. It looks like a tremendously fun game. So definitely this is one that's on my radar. Our last game, 1944 D-Day to the Rhine. Now this is the successor game to Battle of the Bulge 1944, both published by Worthington Games. Now I'm gonna confess, okay? When I first saw Battle of the Bulge 1944 and I read about its components and stuff like that, I'm like, eh, no, nah, it's too simple. It's not a game that I would like. I would like something with a little bit meat, more meat onto it. And then since then, I've seen a number of YouTubers play the game and I've been kind of just absolutely just sucked in by the gameplay. It's I think with the, this type of a game, right? So it's a sh quick playing. It's got one 22 inch by 34 inch map, not a ton of counters. It's gonna be a relative, it's gonna be a game that I think takes a more minimalist approach to this combat, yet at the same time, allows you to get all of the interesting decisions and all of the fun decisions that occur in this campaign and plays out the whole history of the game. And as I watch the Battle of the Bulge play, it's like, wow, this is really good. I think the word I would use to describe these this type of series here, it's a very tight series. There's not a lot of chrome. There's not a lot of rules overhead. There's not a lot of time wasted. You're going to get right into the combat and you're making the interesting decisions that happen in that game. And you're creating a narrative and a history as to how this campaign is going to play out for you. And I think nothing against bigger games and nothing against Chrome. I love those games, but sometimes you're just looking for something that is tight, 
fast playing and yet really challenges your brain to make some really good decisions. And as I've watched the Battle of the Bulge be played, the same game, you know, in the same series, I said, wow, that looks like a lot of fun. It's a type of game you can open up after dinner. It's going to get to the table. This is not a game that's going to kind of sit on your shelf and never get played and become eventually be a game of shame. It's going to be a game that you're going to take out. You can play it in a single sitting. It plays fast. It plays quickly. And if D-Day to the Rhine is in any way close to the same experience of the Battle of the Bulge, I'm very interested in it. Now, the unfortunate thing here, if you're thinking, where do I get it? Well, the Kickstarter for this game has expired. It's going to be available in December of 1922, according to the Kickstarter page, uh, 2022, <laughs> according to the Kickstarter page. So I expect that there'll be copies available then. And also the unfortunate thing is the Battle of the Bulge isn't available either. So <laughs> kind of very interested in them, but I expect at some point, it's not like I'm lacking things to play, let's be fair. Um, at some point, I expect I'll be able to figure out how to pick these up and be able to dig into them. But very much got my radar. It's on my list of games to watch as it goes forward. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it comes out. That brings us to the end of upcoming War Games number three. If you have War Games that you'd like to see featured in these episodes, you're like, why did he put that one in there? Feel free to reach out to me either in the comments below or via Twitter or via my email. Be happy to consider other games to come in. If you have enjoyed this episode and you're looking for other episodes like this to watch, you might enjoy our Wargaming Shelf Tours, where we take a look at 10 semi-random games that are on my Wargaming shelves and why they're there and why I like them. Thanks so much for tuning, everybody, tuning in, everybody. We'll see you again soon.